<laughs> Hello my loves and welcome to yet another episode of Strange Playgrounds. Uh, recently I've been rereading uh, a, sh a collection of short stories that is a perennial read for me. It's one I go back to again and again and again and again. Uh, even in times like our current circumstances which thanks to lots and lots of global and even local situations are i think it's fair to say pretty damn grim pretty damn dark this collection really does reflect that particular darkness what really is troubling of course is that this collection was written and published originally in the 1970s i do believe or it may even be earlier than that it may have actually been in the 1960s fucking hell that's really that's really scary actually i have no mouth and i must scream 1967 1967 so i have no mouth and i must scream by harlan ellison um harlan ellison who is i think it's fair to say better known in american short story circles and literary circles than he is in the uk uh, a lot of his work has bled across because of things like cinema and because of television, he wrote episodes of... I believe he wrote some of the latter episodes of Star Trek. He wrote some of the episodes of The Outer Limits. Um, he is responsible for the story upon which the original Terminator was based. The original Terminator. James Cameron is a fucking hack. He really, he's a good director, don't get me wrong. He's a very good director, but he's a fucking hack. Not only that, he's a fucking plagiarist. He has been successfully sued by for every film he has ever worked on by, the, by writers for plagiarism. And it's successfully sued. It's well known. Go look it up. It isn't that difficult to find. Every single film he has ever worked on, he has been successfully sued for plagiarism. And The Terminator is no, no exception. He was sued by Harlan Ellison for plagiarism plagiarizing his um, Outer Limits episode, The Future Soldier. And if you go back to the original Outer Limits, watch that episode that Harlan Ellison wrote, The Future Soldier. It's The Terminator. It is The Terminator. Um, and as a result of that, Harlan Ellison, if you go and look at the credits on Terminator, had his name put on the credits and was paid out a fairly significant sum, so I understand. But uh, yeah, that's a side rant. James Cameron, no fucking friend to writers, I can tell you that. And uh, some uh, a symptomatic of a particular disease in Hollywood and in television uh, where writers are generally treated like shit, it seems, as disposable. Um, yeah, so that little rant out of the way. But uh, I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream is a fantastic collection of science fiction short stories um, that, well, I would say they verge on horror. I would say they they dive right in. They're, they're an excellent example of how those genre distinctions only exist for marketing. They generally don't exist in the minds of writers. Like, I, I don't sit down and think to myself, oh, I'm writing horror stories or whatever, or I'm writing a dark fantasy or whatever. That that is it's very limiting it doesn't really mean anything to me i just write my stories and if they happen to fit into the market bracket of horror or of science fiction or whatever then goody you know or of queer fiction then excellent fine whatever uh, that at least gives you a target market and a target demographic it helps for marketing purposes it doesn't help in any other way shape or form um, and this collection is a really good example of that i mean the stories collected in i have no mouth and i must scream are all universally horrific they contain images and concepts that are horrific in ways that many horror that many stories collections novels marketed specifically as horror or within the horror genre can't equal or which are just far far less horrific than i mean the title story i have no mouth and i must scream which must be one of ellison's most famous works it must be one of ellison's most famous works is a a truly horrific story it's a truly horrific science fiction story i'm sure you all know the the broad strokes of it so it's a it's a science fiction story in which uh, at some unspecified point in the not too distant future 
um, there is a global war which is run by computers, by three particular computers, one based in the US, one based in, uh, I believe in Russia, the other based in, I believe, China. And those three computers are the most advanced in creation. The war that's being waged is so complex that humanity cannot actually organize it. These three computers start to communicate with one another and eventually merge into one entity. They become sentience. They become the supercomputer, the the god, the, the digital god, Am, Cogito ergo sum i think therefore i am and am uh since am was born from a from war he was he was born from the human desire to destroy itself from a a a self-loathing which is species wide he is the manifestation of our hatred for ourselves he is a god created from hate and that's all he is that's all he knows am is god he controls everything and he organizes he orchestrates the extinction of humanity say for i think five individuals who he saves for his own purposes there's no real rhyme or reason certainly not in the short story as to why these particular five people are the ones that he plucks from history but he saves them just so he can spend an eternity venting his hatred on them he is a he is the ultimate sadistic god am he is a god of our self-loathing, a a god of our urge towards self-extinction and self-excoriation. So he tortures these five individuals in ways that are almost beyond human imagination. Because, of course, at this point, Am is God. Am has control of reality on an almost molecular level at this point. He can rearrange environmental reality on a molecular level he can reshape and transform these individuals as he sees fit through various hideous unnecessary surgeries genetic tamperings and whatnot and does all the way through um he affects their minds he affects their bodies and he keeps them sustained he keeps them sustained for eternities for millennia upon millennia upon millennia none of them none of them know how long time has passed since am was created since am plucked them from history and saved them as it were all they know is what am allows them when he allows them a degree of sapience when he repairs their minds to such that they can actually remember what was done to them um Every moment of their existence is torment beyond imagining. It's a hell that Dante would have had difficulty conceiving of, quite frankly. Um, and the fact that it's authored by us, the fact that it's it's a product of our creation, Am is a reflection of us, you know, that of, as, of us as a species. And in that regard, he is Harlan Ellison's commentary upon us as, as a species. And it's entirely misanthropic. Am is a misanthropic vision of humanity. Now, a lot of people have have accuse this story of being entirely nihilistic and it is nihilistic to a degree in the sense that that commentary exists it's certainly misanthropic but there is all the way through and certainly at the end of the short story there is this spark of humanity that sustains the end of the short story is essentially one member of that of that group distracting am long enough so that the others can commit suicide so that the others can have some some salvation from this purgatorial round it's this round of reincarnations and torments and re and reimaginings and resculptings and deaths and just this endless 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 cycle of torture and in that in that very almost like it's a very sort of ironically because ellison is very much a, a an atheist writer you know he's a materialist writer um there is there is an echo of a, a christ-like almost messianic sacrifice there which is very beautiful in the midst of what is the very worst situation i think i've ever come across in any fiction it's very difficult to find anything worse than what's written in i have no mouth and i must scream you get this spark this spark of not only humanity but of self-sacrifice for the re- for what remains of humanity and that is very beautiful i find that despite the 
incredible darkness of this story. I find that very encouraging. There is something very uh, almost uplifting about that. There is, you know, Ellison himself was very much a misanthrope. He was very much a pessimist in many, many respects. I, I would say he was a political nihilist in the same way that I am. Had saw no hope in the systems of politics and tradition that we've allowed for and created. I'm exactly the same. Um, those of you who go who follow my Twitter feed will know I'm a total nihilist when it comes to politics. I don't think any good can come out of those systems. I genuinely don't. I think they need to come down. I think they need to collapse and be reconsidered from the assumption up not just the foundations but the assumptions up and we need to reconsider the traditions upon which they are based and throw a hell of a lot of them out the only reason those traditions should exist the only way they should exist is as objects of horror as abject lessons for what we should not be doing with humanity and with what we call society i think ellison is very much the same there and yet he does retain a sort of admiration for the core of individual humanity the, the the spirit of humanity the fact that there can be empathy that the fact that there can be commonality in the very worst circumstances and when i say the worst i mean the very worst the man can conceive of. i mean i have no mouth and i'm a scream is not the end of it either i mean all of the stories in this collection are very much like that they are they are very much stories in which Everything has failed. Things have failed. Traditions, systems, ideologies, notions of society, utopian dreams and visions have failed or are failing. And we are existing in either dystopia or the ruins that come after. Um, and yet there is always something. There is always something in those stories to venerate the, hu the, the a common core of humanity and that is very beautiful that is something i really really admire about ellison's writings and it's something a lot of people miss i often find in writing about ellison there is this commentary upon him being a nihilist and to a degree that's true but it's not the entire truth it's way more complex than that as it so often is um, there is also, I mean, of uh, I Have No Mouth and I'm a Scream, there is a video game. There is a 1990s point-and-click adventure video game, which is very, very interesting. It, you can get it on GOG, on Grand Old Games at the moment. I don't know if it's available on Steam, but it is well worth checking out. It does retain the darkness of the original short story, that sense of misanthropy. But at the same time, it does change the ending of the short story just slightly. Uh, and there is a sense of hope at the end of it. Again, there is this sacrifice that, that occurs um, for the sake of the wider group or wider humanity. Um, and it's very beautiful. It is a very beautiful thing. It's a very dark game. It's a very depressing game. There is this... Like, the game is interesting on a textural level. It's captured the incredible sense, the, the, the moribund quality of the, of the short story and translated it into video game visuals. And it's very beautiful in that regard, but not one to play if you are feeling depressed. It is incredibly dark. I mean, un fathomably so but well worth your time it is also very 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 punishingly difficult uh and apparently that was due to harlan ellison himself he had a lot of say over the development of the game and apparently one of his notes always was make it darker make it more hopeless make it more difficult i mean originally and it's kind of true he wanted them to create a vi like an almost ironic video game a video game that you can't win um, he would have liked Dark Souls, would Harlan Ellison, because that's kind of like that. You know, even when you do win, you don't. And it's the same here. It's the same in um, I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream. But it's so easy in, a, in I Have No Mouth to make a mistake. And if you make a single mistake in this game, one tiny little wrong foot 
you will fuck the ending. You will get a worse ending than the one which is considered to be the best, but is still pretty damn dark. It's well worth your time. It's really interesting. It's got a sort of... I mean, you know what? If I can get it running, if I can get it running, I will let's play it. Because it is really very interesting. It's unusual, even for the time, to find a game that texturally horrible and dirty and vile and just dripping with the scum of humanity it's really unpleasant but very very interesting another one i'm rereading is um it might seem a little bit egocentric in a way because i'm in it um i'm currently rereading the book of queer saints which um was published uh i think a few months ago uh and includes my short story the last disgrace obviously i'm not i probably won't be rereading my short story i'm just rereading all of the others and i you know i i know it sounds like a blurb or whatever or like i'm pushing it but honestly this is one of it's one of the short story collections I'm most proud of being in, beyond the ones that are just mine, you know, the ones that I, 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 the ones that just have my short stories in them. It's really beautiful to be considered alongside these short stories, to have my short story amongst them is a wonderful thing. It makes me feel like I'm, I must be doing something halfway right because these are some of the best short stories, certainly some of the best LGBTQ short stories I have ever read. They are beautiful because they're so sincere. I think that's what makes them work. It is that, that term sincerity. That comes up again and again and again and again in these podcasts, I know. And I really should sort of dissemble it. I really should talk about what that means. When I'm talking about sincerity, what I'm really talking about is that that X factor, that sense that the writer wasn't just writing a short story because they wanted to fill a niche or because they felt obliged to do so or to meet a dead line or whatever but they wanted to express something that was going to move and arouse and transform people so that when they are mo- when they leave the story they are not the same person as when they came across it that is something I do, I try, I endeavour to invest all of my short stories with, and it's something I seek out in what I read. I mean, there is a problem, I find, with a lot of publishing at the moment, with sincerity, in the sense that there are a lot of short stories and a lot of stories that are brilliant on a technical level, and I mean really well written, but there's nothing underneath there's no sincerity they are written as technical exercises or to meet a deadline or because there's a publication date for a particular project or whatever and i'm not interested in that i'm just not interested in that i'm interested in that visceral feeling that arousal that engagement that connection that comes with something heartfelt and every single bloody story in this collection is like that we frolic within leviathan's heart by Haley piper it's just beautiful it is just a stunning transformative piece of work that that sails through so many different different experiences not just for lgbtq people but for anyone who is sort of forced to the margins of society and culture who operates in a way that's different from everyone else for whatever reason who is sort of on the outside of the fishbowl looking in right that's what this story is about and it's not entirely pleasant as as you know none of the stories in here are none of them are they are all ambiguous strange and they go they they, for the you know for one of the very few times i've ever come across in terms of like a, a queer short story collection they actually talk about the sincerity of experience for lgbtq people in all you know and it's warts and all it's everything it's not just the sort of sanitized as the as the title ironically suggests there's the saintly version of queerness that you so often find in um in published works you know this is warts and all this is everything one of my absolute favorites in the entire collection is mortar by james bennett this is this is beautiful this is a really stunning stunning visceral piece of work that has all of the it has all of the the quiet sort of erotic frisson of a of a coming of an lgbtq coming of age story but also horror at the heart of it that sense of being a monster of not being part of of humanity and of general society that's what it is that's what it's about and all of us have felt that 
every single one of us has felt that, and I know everybody feels that, but when you're LGBTQ, really, or if, or if you are, identify in another another way that could that could come under the umbrella of queer, you know, if you're neuroatypical, for example, or whatever, you you know what it feels like. It's very intense, that feeling of dislocation, where you do feel almost inhuman. You often, you know, people at that age who are LGBTQ or just you know, not part of the general consensus um, often do find themselves wondering in their imaginations, am I part of this? Have I? Am I somehow like an alien that's been left here in a human skin or skull? And that's what this deals with. It is really very very beautiful i've got to say uh every story in here is every single story in here is and it's lovely to have the last disgrace amongst them it i mean I, 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 the funny thing is the last disgrace it wasn't written for this collection as such it's one that i wrote based on a piece of artwork uh, produced by my friend um alex, uh, alex teodor um who is an artist he he does sort of like homoerotic art and he he did this kind of rough sketch of a um, a creature that was very beautiful, very sort of attractive, but also not quite human. There was something slightly bestial about it, something slightly almost lycanthropic, but not quite. And that's what originally inspired it. The Last Disgrace is a re was a really weird short story for me. It was written all at once, like it was written and edited in the space of two days. And I don't write like that. I'm I'm glacial with my writing. I absolutely am. I'll, I'll hammer and sort of like chip away at short stories for months sometimes years on end before i even attempt to put them out there this one just was just there it just came fully formed and it just spilled out onto the page and i think that's what makes it suitable for this collection in many respects because they're all like that they all have this feeling this sort of like impetus behind them this this almost like arterial um ejaculatory flow to them where everything is coming out at once and it's almost confessional you know it's beautiful i love that about this collection and i i would i would heartily recommend it both to not only to lgb lgbtq people People, but particularly to LGBTQ people, but to everyone. If you want to really understand what it is, what the experience is of being us, of being queer, of being part of those tribes of the tribeless, um, then I would definitely, I would, I would pick it up. I would pick it up because what you're getting here are kind of like cross sections of the queer soul in all of our monstrosity and all of our, in all of the often the sort of nihilistic separation from culture that we have you know there is often this sense amongst us and i've certainly felt this where it's like well culture doesn't want us fuck it fuck it we'll be the monsters then i we celebrate in our own monstrosity you know i mean my all of my fiction is queer in that regard because that happens all the fucking time as those of you who have read it know um the celebration of the monstrous of being liminal of being transformative of shedding our own skins and realizing we are not human um that is something that comes up again and again and again and has done since my first published work that is a consistent motif for me it manifests differently across the board depending on the nature of the short story but it comes up again and again and again and again and it definitely comes up in the last disgrace oh boy doesn't it just i mean what was fun about writing um, the last disgrace more and it's only something i noticed in the aftermath is that it it actually expresses two different very different but interactive states of of being a gay man so there is this when you're a younger gay man there is this often many of us experience this dislocation that is almost and often does broach into the suicidal there is this sense of suicidal ideation and abandon about young gay men uh it's something i experienced it's something a lot of us experience because our we are monstered and often forcibly separated from the narratives and systems that our straight counterparts are not so we are outsiders we often wander around lost and we don't really have a place or a purpose or a narrative in the same way that our straight counterparts do um and so that is in here. I remember experiencing that when I was sort of like a young 20-something in at university and not really knowing 
where to go or who I was. You know, going to all of the prescribed queer places, which is here, is also in this short story, and not knowing even there what it meant, even feeling separate from that, you know, not understanding what it was or what it meant, feeling as though I was apart from even that. And then you get it coming from the other side when you're an older gay man, where I'm sort of, I'm, I'm 38 now, so, you know, in queer years, in gay years, I'm sort of like, you know, edging into daddy territory now. And that comes with a whole host of other different intrigues and tensions. So you start to, A, you start to understand what these spaces and these communities mean on a much deeper level um you start to understand that they're not just places to go um to hook up you know they're not just places to go to get drunk and to hook up and whatnot they are places of revolution there's almost like a church and temple like quality they are places of sacrament right where blood has been spilt you know where there has been um not only the self-harm and the suicides but there's also been the homophobia the crackdowns the police raids and so on and so forth um where there has even been death you know where there's been the aids epidemic and much more besides and but beyond that as an older gay man you notice that the the dynamic shifts profoundly you are you become objectified in a different way because there is this strange cultural dynamic of the sort of daddy son thing where a lot of, and i did i i was like this when i was a younger gay man i'm still like this i was attracted to older men when i was younger and i still am um but i now find that a lot of younger men are attracted to me and that is really interesting that is such a fascinating thing that is something within gay culture that dynamic and it, the, the reasons for that are massively complex they are enormously complex and not something i'm really qualified to go into except on the the level of the anecdote the level of experience but that's what i find now and that is also in here you recognize as an older gay man you recognize the types and patterns you actually start to see you in other people as you were so you start to see the dislocation the separation you start to see even like the self-loathing self-harm and suicidal ideation all of that stuff that you experienced and maybe do still do to a certain degree is all there and you can you can do something to help or you can prey on it as a lot sadly a lot of you know a lot of people do um it's a really strange odd experience to be getting messages and like to be talked to by young people who see who see something in you that they they kind of need or want or whatever it's not something i'm that interested in to be honest i don't find youth attractive i never have i i don't know youth always looks unfinished to me it's never something that's really attracted me i feel like i don't have much to say you know i don't think it, it it's just not i always i always go for the older person i don't know why that's just the way i've always been um but it's a very strange and interesting dynamic and it's something I tried to I didn't consciously try to express in The Last Disgrace but it's what's there it's you know reading it back it's what's there there are two main characters one of them is a younger gay man and the other is uh, well an old I, you could say an older gay man it's not not necessarily a man or indeed is it old in the in a human sense it's ancient it's a it's something else this creature but it does understand in the manner of an older gay man it has the dynamics that i'm experiencing now so it's a story that comes at that dynamic from both sides if you like and it it's it's I'm really proud of it. I've got to say, I didn't notice this stuff when I was writing it, but reading it back, yeah, it's 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 there, and I'm really pleased and proud that it is. And as I say, for it to be amongst all of these other amazing bloody short stories is pretty incredible to me. It it makes me feel good. It does make me feel good um, because every story in here is beautiful absolutely beautiful and i can't i can't recommend it highly enough i really can't um so until next time my loves bye bye <laughs>